Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about a secret club made up exclusively by women in the early 20th century in New York City. The club was called Heterodoxy and it would be considered a forerunner to the American feminist movement. In fact, the term feminism at this time was new and it was perceived as a controversial and even an explosive term term and perhaps even akin to the way today we use the term critical race theory. However, I'll ask my guest if that's an appropriate comparison or not. My guest is Joanna Scutts. Joanna Scutts is the author of the book that we will be in conversation about. It's called Hotbed, Bohemian Greenwich Village, and the Secret Club that Sparked Modern Feminism. Joanna Scutts, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I had never heard of this club called Heterodoxy. Uh, I even did, after in, in the process of preparing for our conversation, even did an online search. There is a Wikipedia page, which is about one one paragraph, one paragraph long. I was, I was surprised it wasn't longer than that. Uh, heterodoxy is an interesting term. If you look it up, it's a deviation from accepted or orthodox standards or beliefs. Tell me about this club named heterodoxy and where does this term come from? Absolutely. Uh, so the fact that you don't know much about it is sort of by design. Uh, the club was quite secretive, uh, sort of an open secret, but they, the women who belonged to it uh, wanted to be able to disagree with each other. That was sort of how they understood heterodoxy. They understood it to mean um, a difference of opinion. Um, the And they felt that the freedom to disagree on questions of politics, on questions of culture, that was really vital to their uh, sort of identity as a discussion club, as a social club. And so they didn't keep records of their meetings. Um, they everything was was off the record. Everything was um, was kind of it was a what we might call today a sort of safe space for discussion, disagreement. And so that has been a problem for historians. Um, traditionally, obviously, a lack of a an archive, a lack of a, uh, a sort of a detailed um, paper trail has made it very difficult to sort of reconstruct what this club was all about and um, and sort of what happened. So researching it required a certain amount of uh, creativity to sort of get around um, that lack of a sort of a central archive. But one thing that I did learn and became very clear in the research was how important this club was to its members, um, not simply as a place to kind of debate issues of policy and questions, especially around feminism, uh, although that was as important, it was also uh, a place for a friendship. Um, some of the um, women who wrote many of these women wrote about their experiences in the club. They wrote memoirs of their time living in Greenwich Village. And heterodoxy really uh, sort of shines as a place that they found fellowship, they found common ground, they met women who were also advanced and unusual in their ideas. And that was really kind of the, uh, the glue that bonded the club together. The club is formed in 1912 in Greenwich Village. Talk to me about Greenwich Village, New York City in this period of time. What's important to know about Greenwich Village? I mean, this is a pretty radical moment in time for New York City, isn't it? Absolutely. It's uh, 1912. Uh, I think I'm right in saying the 1912 election is the highest. Uh, the Socialist Party was sort of the had the highest point in its in its history right if i and, recall correctly i think i think this is is this when eugene victor debs gets like a million votes for 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 president yep yeah that's right just just short of a million votes um and a lot of those came from working people in, in new york and there was a real so new york is a really uh dynamic place in the early 20th century um huge numbers of immigrants are coming from Eastern Europe and many of them are bringing sort of radical political ideas with them. Um, and the village is this sort of curious place because it's very close to 
the Lower East Side, where there's a lot of, uh, you know, which we sort of know as an immigrant neighborhood, a working class neighborhood, where um, new arrivals are really kind of cramming into tenement buildings. And there's just a huge, uh, you know, a huge and very largely very poor, but um, sort of energetic place. And the village is sort of next to that, um, the next neighborhood over. It also at the time was um, an immigrant community, but a slightly more uh, mixed one. There were some older immigrants, lots of Italians were there. Um, there's also the remnant of um, a big African-American community that's in the process of moving uh, sort of uptown into uh, higher further north in Manhattan and eventually to Harlem. But at the time, the, the village has a pretty big uh, black community. It has this big Catholic community. And then it has around the edge of Washington Square Park, a on the sort of the northern side, has some very wealthy families. So it's a real, uh, it's a very dense and um, dynamic neighborhood. And because it was a little bit rough around the edges, there was a lot of opportunity to live cheaply. Uh, so some of the more um, kind of young middle class activists and and kind of aspiring artists as well were flocking to the village in the early part of the 20th century. So 1912, when heterodoxy begins, is kind of the a real sort of high point of the village as a place where you would go if you were a young person, especially looking for a kind of a social purpose, but also an artistic community. You were looking for somewhere where the rules were different, where you could stay out late. Uh, for women, it was a place where you could, you know, meet meet people, make friends, be in mixed company without chaperones. There was a lot of drinking. There was a lot of socializing. Uh, so it had this kind of um, energy as a sort of as an artistic community and and as a politically radical one. So one of the things I wanted to express in the in the title, in this idea of a hotbed, was really the sense that the village was a place where new ideas were being tried out all the time. And heterodoxy is one of many clubs and societies which were set up formally or informally to discuss the issues of the day, which were which were many. Um, there was a a lot of interest in trying to do something about the inequality of society, uh, the excess um, of the Gilded Age, and the fact that there were so many era you know, sort of the the beginnings of a new America. Uh, it was just looking like a very different place and a new century, and and the. These people, these young radicals, not all of them young, but these radical thinkers were trying to figure out, like, what is what is 20th century America going to look like? And especially for the women in my book, what is it going to look like for women? Because that also really felt like an urgent and question that was very much an open one at the time. Cl clubs are important in this period of time. I mean, this is before the Internet. This is this is how people exchanged ideas. Yes, there's all kinds of uh, clubs, associations, societies. Um, the women in my book belonged to endless uh, clubs. Really, there's uh, um, you know the acronym. You can kind of get absolutely buried in in acronyms and um, and names of associations. Uh, so, and they work in a lot of different ways. Uh, for women, especially, there's a long history of clubs as um, the place where before the vote, women could organize and accrue some kind of political power, at least in terms of sort of lobbying and influence. Um, so the women's club movement is a slightly earlier um, political and social movement that's, um, that's very important as a kind of forerunner to heterodoxy. Those uh, those women's political clubs, um, there were some especially really important ones uh, for African American women. It was one of the places where um, where Black women organizers came together and um, were really 
trying to figure out how to to kind of put lobbying pressure on men and also to kind of advocate for their own causes um for the the kind of improvement and uplift and support um especially of other women like them and white women had uh, there are there are certainly there were some integrated clubs as well but it's a fairly segregated moment in american culture so we tend to see a lot of clubs that were um they were just there were white women's clubs and and black women's clubs but they were a vital part of the kind of political landscape even though women didn't have the vote and of course lobbying for the vote was a big part of their raison d'etre in this period and heterodoxy is it's mostly white educated club not exclusively there is Grace Nell mm-hmm. Johnson who's African American civil rights activist who was part of this club we'll talk about her but but before we get to the actual women in the club themselves and as individuals heterodoxy is a it's a secret club is that out of necessity not so much necessity as desire i think that there was this sense of wanting to keep discussions somewhat secret it also i think was a way of distinguishing what heterodoxy was doing from what these political clubs of a previous generation were doing it's it's not really trying to do anything and that was i think what really makes it different and special it didn't have an agenda beyond the sort of support, the mutual support and interest and the kind of network that it was building uh it wasn't a suffrage club although many of the women involved were suffragists uh there's a lot of associated um and allied groups the um with more explicit causes um certainly as world war 1 gets underway there is a big pacifist and civil liberties uh kind of arm of the group but the but heterodoxy itself isn't geared to any one particular kind of policy goal um and so that really i think that's the combination of that of the lack of an explicit political purpose and the desire to keep the discussion sort of open and freewheeling i think that's really where the secrecy comes in um and and it definitely seems to have been liberating um and it seems to have done helped to forge friendships this club it's worth noting started in 1912 but we know that it continued meeting well into the 1930s um it live it survived as a network and a friendship group uh for about a quarter century and far longer than many of the political clubs in the village so i i was really fascinated by that question that how you know did a club that didn't really have a particular purpose why did it last so long and why did it have such a an impact in the lives of its members and and it would be associated with radical politics we'll talk about the term feminism in a moment but also there were women in this club heterodoxy that would go on to form the and help form the American Civil Liberties Union ACLU was formed out of the red scare that heterodoxy was also a target of of the government during this period of time and then you have other uh members of heterodoxy including uh Elizabeth Gurley Flynn who is a labor activist and also one of the founders of the industrial workers of the world so and then we'll get to the idea of feminism too i, I guess to some people still controversial today i don't know but 100 years ago 110 years ago very much so 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 this is sort of a radical group in a very much a radical group isn't it absolutely and i think that the evolution of feminism over the course of the 20th century uh, means that we've lost a little bit of the radicalism of of the word um and certainly its association with socialism at this time um socialism was not was bigger than the socialist party um although the socialist party we've said was was pretty powerful a pretty um prominent in national politics and certainly in new york politics in this time but it wasn't just the party the ideas of socialism sort of small s socialism were were really 
gaining ground across uh, you know sort of all uh, sort of um, all aspects of the left all um, it wasn't simply the most radical people in the workers unions who were advocating for it it was also very popular among sort of middle class reformers um, there was a kind of large scale sense that socialism in some form some kind of reorganizing of the structure of society um some way of redistributing the enormous wealth that was clustered among such a tiny tiny uh, number of capitalists at the very top that there was a basic injustice there that needed to be uh needed to be addressed and partly i think for certainly for middle class reformers a sense that revolution was brewing that there was a frightening extreme version of socialism that they actually didn't want and so a large part of this uh the popularity of socialism in general was kind of a sense of you know, we have to make these changes in order to stave off what we see brewing in russia especially um the failed 1905 revolution is something that people are very aware of there's an awful lot of immigrants coming from uh Russia, the the Russian Empire, as it was at the time, really bringing with them um, Bolshevism and and the ideas of of the Bolsheviks are really spreading. And and there was a fear, certainly among the American upper classes, that manifested in different ways. But the sense that this was um, this was a genuine threat, and so figuring out how to balance that those obligations, on the one hand, to make society fairer and uh, and share and allow workers to share in the wealth that they were creating but on the other hand to stave off revolution that that's sort of the um the tricky kind of political balance that i think socialism is is addressing at this time and feminism is absolutely enmeshed in those ideas because one of the uh major uh the the sort of major thinkers around socialism were were really taking into account the sense that women were uh you know women's rights really needed to be um thought through and addressed in a much more comprehensive way than simply giving them the vote um the vote was a large part of what they wanted to do, but the idea of kind of, well, what are women going to do with the vote? How are we going to use it? What are the other goals that the vote kind of opens up? Um, the feminists tended to be thinking a lot more along those lines, uh, much more radically about restructuring uh, society to be fairer to women, rethinking how families worked, rethinking how marriage worked, and trying to find ways to give women, especially working women, which was honestly most of them, um, a, a say in how their lives were were run. Uh, so the so the sense that something needed to be done sort of urgently because the discrepancy, the unfairness of of American society was so visible. Um, these were all so. So these were the currents that are kind of flowing. Um, this is what is happening. And, and in the village, really, this is where the people, leading thinkers are kind of bringing all these ideas together and thinking about, okay, how is it, we need to do something. So what are we going to do and how is it going to This is work? being debated within the club, heterodoxy. Yes, absolutely. Um, they are thinking about, they're thinking about the best way to win the vote. They're also entertaining uh, people like Emma Goldman, who was a very famous anarchist, of course, and she wasn't a member of the club, but she came and spoke um, at meetings. And she was uh, obviously someone whose ideas were very much in the air. The more radical uh, labor activists were also uh, talking about how to... Um, you know how how to improve lives for workers. The um, massive industrial strikes uh, that are sort of um, punctuating the uh, the existence of the club. There is always you know there's so many of the um, 
the major strikes that we remember among factory workers uh, in New Jersey, in uh, Massachusetts. These are um, strikes that the women of heterodoxy are very much involved in, uh, either as organizers the bread and or as roses journalists. strikes in, in Massachusetts? Uh, Lawrence, especially oh, right. um, the Lor yeah the Lawrence textile strike um, in 1912. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the major labor actions. And then there's the Patterson silk strike uh, later in the same year. Um, and then there's smaller strikes that we don't sort of remember quite as well. But there was like a big strike among New York City waiters and uh, bar staff um, that was and hotel staff uh, that was a huge disruption in. Uh, over the uh, the winter of 1912 um, and some great stories that kind of came out of that. But the IWW was very involved in all of those strikes and trying to unionize, trying to bring workers together in uh, as a sort of single block and exerting their, their power uh, kind of en masse. That was really the goal. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Joanna Scutts about her book. It's called Hotbed, Bohemian Greenwich Village and the Secret Club that Sparked Modern Feminism. The history of the term feminism is fascinating in of itself. Tell me about the word feminism in this period of time. So what's really striking is how much effort in the early 1910s is being expended to define it. Um, it's of a term that comes from French, and it, when it first appears in English language newspapers and magazines, it's showing up in French, often just as feminisme, it's italicized or in quotations, it's kind of this strange foreign idea, and then gradually it becomes uh, normalized, it becomes more common, but it's still a, a very charged word, I would say. Um, the, the women of heterodoxy are not the only ones, but they are very prominent in writing articles that sort of all have titles that are a variation on what is feminism. And there's sort of this idea that you, you know, you've heard this term. If you're a, you know, if you're a someone who's alert to, you know, social change and social trends, you know, you, you will have heard this term. So let us explain what it means. And the meaning and the definition are never. Uh, there's never a single or simple answer to that. Um, a lot of these what is feminism essays are actually explorations about uh, kind of the writer's personal experiences and personal approach to to that idea. Um, it, part of the slipperiness of the term is that it kind of means everything. Um, it kind of signals uh, a new sort of uh, a, a totally new idea of what it means to be a woman. Um, and there are different sort of, there are kind of different schools of thought and different theories about, about what feminism means. But certainly in this period around 1912 and in the 1910s, the, the word is in the air, it's on everyone's lips, and there's a real energy around trying to define it. I said in my introduction, I, I, I compared it to kind of our reaction today to the term critical race theory. Obviously not exactly the same thing, but is that an apt comparison, do you think? I think so. I mean, I think it's a little more general than that. I think the, because one of the questions was, is this a, you know, is this a theory or is this, you know, a movement? Um, what, what is, you know, an, an ism is a very kind of loose uh, collection of ideas, um, but certainly something, you know, some terms that are a little looser. I, I guess one equivalent now would be something like woke. Uh, kind of, what does that mean? Where does it come from? Why does some? Why is everybody suddenly using it? And you know, who's defending it? Who's attacking it? That so it's something. It's it's got a certain. It's somewhere between the two. It's a little more colloquial in general, I would say, than than critical race theory. Uh, but it definitely has that, uh, you know, it's it's to do with women, uh, which makes it explosive um, at this time, because the vote is, uh, the, the activism for the vote, vote is really kind of 
picking up again in the second decade of the 20th century. It's been a little bit sort of the, the movement has gone a little quiet at the, around the turn of the century. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony um, are both no longer with us by 1910. So there is a sense that the movement kind of died with them. And so a new generation is really kind of picking it up. And so part of the interest in defining feminism is about defining it in relation to suffrage. Um, and there's a sort of a tone of, well, we thought we understood what the what the ladies wanted. They wanted the vote, right? We, un we, we understand suffrage. Uh, so what's this feminism doing? Why isn't it, why do we need a new word on top of suffragism? And, and what's the difference? So a lot of the, the definition is about saying, oh, we need more. We don't just need the vote. We need to rethink the entire place of women in society. That's interesting. I, I, I was thinking if Fox News was around 110 years ago, they would be having a segment every night about feminism. But then I had to rethink that. I'm like, well, wait a minute, because I do watch conservative media to see what's going on. And wait a minute, they, they already are doing that today in, in 2022. So, <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Yes, it doesn't It doesn't go away. I mean, this uh, there. It was then and there is now a real uh, a segment of society that is very, very uh, intimidated by the idea of women being able to say no to the bargains that have traditionally been offered them by, by society. And there is a fear of like kind of what if all the women decided not to uh, get married and it all these the fears are always kind of well. What if everyone did it? And it's like there's nothing that everyone does. <laughs> there's no that that fear is always excessive. But there is a, a genuine sense that um, you know our society has depended on the unpaid labor of women to have children and raise children and and kind of continue as a species. And there's this sort of very deep rooted fear, I think, that if women all together decided to stop doing that, well, it's a kind of existential doom. And so it's surprising how very quickly uh, opponents of feminism sort of leap to that sort of nihilistic vision that, you know, the women are just going to quit and then the human race is going to quit. And it's sort of that's never the goal, obviously, but but it tends to. That's the fear, I think. Marie Jenny Howe is considered the founder of this club, Heterodoxy. Um, Marie Jenny Howe was also a Unitarian minister, which I also found interesting. I, I suspect, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong. That 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 might have been unusual at that time. It was. Um, Unitarians were one of the only uh, major church, um, one of the main major churches that allowed women to be ordained as ministers. Um, and she was from upstate New York, uh, raised in a very progressive family. Um, her older sister was a lawyer, um, became a very pioneering lawyer, I think, was one of the first women to qualify for the bar in New York State. So she came from a, a forward-thinking family. Her mother was a suffrage activist. and But her turn to the church uh, was sort of unusual in her family. But she saw it as a way of um, being able to have, I think, some pastoral and sort of political influence um, in a very... Uh, sort of community-minded way. And so she studied um, at the um, seminary in Pennsylvania, and then she was posted to Iowa. Um, the interesting part about that is this early 20th century kind of group of women ministers in the Unitarian Church who were very um, active, and they called themselves the Iowa Sisterhood. And it was partly the challenge was that women in the church were allowed to be ordained, but then they were sort of shipped off to these uh, then pretty remote places, at least remote from the centers of influence um, in the church. And so, but in Iowa, she sort of was taken under the wing of another woman minister, was mentored and sort of learned that women who worked together 
could make change. And there seemed to be sort of, I think there's a real sense that her interest in women's communities and what women working together could do was really forged in this um, this early experience in the church, in the ministry. But there's not a lot I had to sort of dig to find. There's not a lot written or about that moment or this group of women. I mean, that's the but challenge about said, yeah. writing about heterodoxy, right? I mean, they didn't, there wasn't a lot of written documents about it itself. There's a lot of uh, memories, recollections, um, somewhat. I think there's a sense that what was easy to find is a sense of how important the club was to its members and how uh, emotionally supportive the group was. Um, the few historians who have written about heterodoxy have sometimes kind of seen that as a as a negative to kind of see it as, well, they had this, everybody writes so sort of sentimentally about this club and they're so effusive about it. And somehow that's been taken as a sign that it was somehow less important. Um, it's negative. The sense yeah, that, negative yeah, it was sort of negative or just like, oh, this was just kind of, you know, ladies with their getting together with their friends and yeah, I don't know. There's a sense in which the important, the the emotional charge of those recollections has made them less seem less important. Um, so in in my book, I really try to take that emotional charge seriously and say, like, what is why is this so important, and why are they expressing themselves with such kind of almost romantic language towards? each other towards the club you know why does it seem like heterodoxy is this uh to use one of their words the ex this experience of unbroken delight you know what is it about this club that makes it you know to, to you know they all seem to talk about it in this um in this really effusive way and i think that's i think that's real i mean partly that's a just a quality of how people express themselves, uh, especially women, together in letters and diaries. We we look at uh, the sort of a very emotional quality often in in women's writing, women's private writing at this period. But they were also publishing this. It was in it was in memoirs. It was um, in you know books and histories about the time, about the village. And I think taking that emotional charge seriously was really. Uh, enlightening for me. It allowed me to see that organizing is not just a question of policy. It's not a political change isn't just something that happens in, you know, among politicians and legislators. It's something that happens. Yeah, there's an emotional quality to it, a sense of, um, you know, urgency and drive that comes from, uh, comes from friendship, comes from community, and as much as from the sort of abstract sense that a a wrong must be righted or an injustice met. You know, I think there's I think we historians are are tend to I mean there is a field of histories of emotions. People are now sort of paying a little more attention to emotions and how they're expressed. But traditionally historians have not have sort of discounted emotion uh, in testimony, and I think I think it's a mistake, especially in feminist history. Heterodoxy was seen as a threat by the government, correct? Uh, it, government targeted heterodoxy during uh, the Red Scare. Was it was it targeted during what was known as the Palmer Raids of this period of time, or, or something akin to that? It didn't have um, a headquarters as such, so um, I don't think that the uh, there wasn't a and, and didn't have these records, so there wasn't really much to raid, but certainly there was surveillance. There's records, um, there's evidence that the group was was followed, that some of its most prominent members, especially Elizabeth Gurley Flynn with her association with the IWW and Rose Pastor Stokes, who was a very prominent socialist activist, uh, they were really uh, both women who were very much on the government's radar, both of whom um, were put on trial for um, 
sedition, under sedition charges. And so they their involvement really was what kind of made the club especially potent. But there was but there were other women who are less somewhat less prominent, um, but you know, suspicious by association. One of those was uh, Fola, La, Fola La Follette, who is the daughter of Senator Bob La Follette, who was the um, Wisconsin senator who opposed the war and was known as a very big, um, you know, known as a sort of left wing uh, figure, a very a pacifist figure. Fighting, fighting so, Bob La Follette, founder of the Progressive Magazine. Bob. That's right. That's right. Yes, he's uh, you know this this great figure, and, and Fola, his eldest daughter, was uh, known as a suffragist. Uh, she was also, as many of the heterodoxy women were, also an artist, an actress, and she. So she was definitely a kind of a known figure, and during World War One, uh, was was followed and targeted. And there were a lot of pacifists in the group, very prominent um, anti-war speakers and activists and so heterodoxy was sort of seen as a as a, an anti-war group and therefore um kind of subject to surveillance and and monitoring for those uh for those reasons it also was the, the war was an issue that, that split the group um there were some more conservative women in the club who left uh based on the kind of support for the pacifist voices. Um, one very prominent journalist uh, whose name is Rita Child Dorr, D-O-R-R. -R. She's not really remembered today, but she wrote a fascinating memoir and she's like an early newspaper woman, a really interesting uh, figure. And she, in her memoir, said that she, she kind of felt that she was on the side of she thought that the U.S. should enter the war, and she felt that the the club wasn't really supportive of that point of view. And so she she writes about deciding that you know she's going to leave the club and um uh, and and be more active in her in her war support. So there were definitely that was one of the places where the differences of opinion that the club prized uh, were too great to be bridged at a time of of such. You know, national crisis. There's another prominent member within this club, Heterodoxy, that I want to ask you about, and that's Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who who wrote and is probably best remembered for her book, Women and Economics. Tell me about the importance of Charlotte Perkins Gilman in the story that you tell. Yeah, she's a she's a really interesting and and sort of a somewhat semi-forgotten figure. Uh, she was actually, I mean, I think now most people know her name for The Yellow Wallpaper, which was a novella that she wrote in 1892, which is a an amazing evocation of a woman suffering from postpartum depression and being, um, being sort of forcibly, uh, well, not exactly, she's under the care of a, a doctor and her husband, and she is kind of constrained to this one room and, and it's sort of uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman herself really suffered after the birth of her daughter and so there's a, a you know this is a lot of very personal uh, experience goes into this fascinating book but it's not really that story is not really representative of her work as a whole she was much better known in her day as you say as an economist and a socialist uh, theorist she was she wrote this book, Women and Economics, in I, uh, basically right around the turn of the century. And it was a kind of a Bible for progressive young women. Uh, Marie Jenny Howe read it in Iowa and wrote a letter to Charlotte um, as this kind of a fan letter and was just saying, you have, you know, you've opened my mind. You've uh, This is all things I've been thinking about and you have kind of exploded my thinking. And essentially, Charlotte Perkins Gilman was sort of seen as a kind of um, a figurehead of the idea of feminism in a way that it kind of became very influential in the US. Um, essentially, feminism as a, um, as a way of correcting society's economic structure. It was about taking women... Uh, 
sort of rethinking society of a society of, of just human beings, refusing to make those distinctions that society had been making for generations about you know, what women were supposed to do and what men were supposed to do. And instead saying, well, what if we were just all human? And what if we were all equal in that, you know, in that humanity? What does a society look like if it's rethought in that way? And it gives women um, economic opportunity. And she really thought that the most important thing for women was to make and control their own money, which many laws made it very difficult for women to do that at this time. There's, you know, some reforms are happening in the realm of sort of divorce and property law, but really women uh, had a lot of trouble keeping a hold and keeping control of their earnings and their inheritance and their money. And that was really something that, that Gilman sort of was like, we have to start with the money. And then once we kind of have, so it was sort of, and it sort of leads towards a kind of version of feminism that is sort of familiar to us about opening professional doors, removing the boundary, the the barriers to women in education, in highly paid professions, the sort of idea that if if women could have the economic and professional opportunities that men do, then the social reform will sort of follow. And so this was a very influential idea at the time. And she had and and she had some more radical theories. She thought about ways that um ways to restructure the home so that women could work and the care of children and the care of the home could be outsourced, um, which of course, you know, it had always been outsourced to servants among a certain class, but she was thinking her idea was that working class women should be, or women who were, should be trained and properly, you know, should be professionals and respected as professional, paid as professionals to take care of children and take care of the home. And so everything was kind of going to be, you know, it was much more about reforming um, the economic structure of society than, than these more nebulous and difficult questions about, you know, internalized misogyny or how women held themselves back by their own expectations is that the spark then for you that this club represented in sparking a modern feminist movement i think i think so i mean i think that the the real part about it, the feminism that i'm very interested in is really about how this group together were responsible for popularizing the idea and continuing to sort of discuss it and debate it um the essence of feminism probably is the idea that it's never finished and <laughs> it's an ongoing project and different members of the club took different uh, approaches to it. Um, there were women in the club who thought uh, along, there was a sort of different strand of feminism that was less interested in making everyone equal as humans and mu more interested in saying that women should, uh, women's ability to be mothers was kind of what set them apart and that there was a sort of um, a way in which the society should reward and, and support women as mothers and what the problem was men and we needed to do away with marriage and we needed to stop having like and women should be kind of paid and supported by the state for being mothers and there should be no stigma attached to having children out of wedlock that shouldn't be relevant at all it should be kind of uh, th this this maternalist sort of feminism was a, a much more sort of separatist idea. It was kind of women are, you know, women's sort of biological nature is what makes them makes them powerful, makes them special. And the problem with society is not that you know women should be more like men; it's that society should respect women as women. So this was so there were there were a lot of different ways in which those the idea of what it meant to give women power. Um, there's a lot of different ideas as to what that could look like. Again, as we talked earlier, this is a club that is mostly white women, educated women, probably women from places of means, financial means. And if I'm wrong on any of that, you'll correct me. There, there was an African-American woman, Grace Nell Johnson. She was a civil rights activist, also a figure within the Harlem Renaissance, 
this club, Heterodoxy, is in Greenwich Village. It's not. It's a good walk from Harlem to Greenwich Village, but manageable. Yeah, you, you know, you can mm-hmm. make it happen. Uh, Greenwich Village is also not. It, it's right next door to um, the Lower East Side, in which there are a lot of immigrant women uh, living in the Lower East Side, uh, who also, you know, you mentioned Emma Goldman, who spoke to the club, but was never a member of the club itself. Well, how, how do you interpret all, all of this as being? primarily a white educated and being a white educated woman at the time is a select few as well I I suspect so how do you interpret the makeup of this club yeah it's a it's a complicated question certainly education I think is the um the the revealing part is that these were primarily women who had had some kind of college education and actually which at the time was a tiny percentage of American women um, were going to women's colleges like a lot of like Vassar and Smith and then the, Barnard and the well-known uh, Seven Sisters colleges and some of the other um, state universities that were opening up to women. So education was sort of the previous generation's big fight, sort of access to college. In this generation, it was much more of a fight to uh, make that education lead somewhere. Um, so there are yeah. several, yes, mean something. So there's several women in the club who qualified as lawyers um, because New York University accepted women as lawyers. Uh, one very prominent, fascinating figure in the club, um, Inez Holland, who was a very glamorous uh, socialite, but also a very educated, smart woman. She there's her correspondence with the dean of the deans of Harvard Law School uh, survives, and it's extremely entertaining. And she was writing to them, and because they refused her admission, and she kept writing back and saying, "You know, this is a sign that you are, you know, you're refusing to kind of enter the modern world, and this will reflect poorly on you." And and sort of, you know, you should accept me because you, I can do more for you than you can do for me. Uh, it was sort of the tone of her correspondence, but they still refused and so nyu as it became that there's a lot of the women in heterodoxy knew each other through graduating from that law school and so law school graduate school phds um sort of professional social work a lot of the women in heterodoxy had been through the columbia school of social work um as it became the school of social work at columbia university so they were not only college educated, but but professionally educated as well. And those colleges certainly were very exclusive, uh, expensive, um, and also many of them barred Jewish students, most of them barred African Americans. Uh, so they so there's simply the nature of getting an education, an elite education in that period is kind of going to self-select women into a, of a certain demographic. So the women who don't fit that demographic in the club include uh, the radicals that I mentioned. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was a working class Irish girl who was raised in the Bronx and became became a speaker, dropped out of high school to become an organizer and a speaker. Rose Pastor Stokes is particularly interesting. She was a Jewish immigrant from a, a, I think what is now Odessa, what was Odessa, or I may be getting that wrong. She was a Jewish immigrant, and she married um, uh, Graham Phelps Stokes, who was the heir to one of the biggest uh, fortunes in America. He was an incredibly wealthy wasp, and their marriage was a very you know a sort of scandalous. Um, kind of amazing uh, sort of you know, a Cinderella story as all the newspapers wrote about it in when they got married in 1905 and they he was a socialist and they worked together for for several years as kind of political activists um, but she was one of the few Jewish members of the club and Grace Nail Johnson interestingly uh, was African-American raised in uh, Brooklyn a very wealth she was in a uh, a member of a very wealthy family. Her father was a, a restaurant owner, businessman, and her brother was instrumental in kind of developing Harlem as a center of African American uh, life and culture in in the early twentieth century. So she was 
She was certainly elite. She uh, was a but patron of, course, of the Harlem Renaissance, no? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and so, and Grace Nail Johnson um, was, uh, she married James Weldon Johnson, who is uh, very well known as a, a, you know, a huge kind of mover and shaker in Harlem, in cultural life, in politics, uh, you know, an enormous uh, polymath and and leader who became uh, the leader of the NAACP in 1920. So she was certainly an unusual uh, figure in to be a member of heterodoxy and simply just kind of occupying a space that such a very, very small number of African-American women occupied in New York at this time. Joanna Scutz has been our guest. Joanna Scutz is the author of the book, Hotbed, Bohemian Greenwich Village, and the secret club that sparked modern feminism. She has joined us for a conversation on this secret club known as heterodoxy. Joanna Scutz, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thank you so much. This was great. <laughs>